caught Markham's attention. On August 6th... Okay, so right there what you have is a compromised individual just by the fact that in that day and age having that held against him, you know, this is what being compromised is, is that to the public he could be exposed and so he'll say and do anything that they will tell him to do. And also, you can see his order of merit, or his high order garb on his his regalia there on his uniform. So you can see that you know he expects full well to be to be fully compensated for his role in this. So, anyways, we can't trust anything that he says at this time, or we can't trust anything that he says at that time because you can see obviously from what we just heard there that he is compromised. That's to the military officer at that time, at that time, that is compromised. 1901, Robert Falcon Scott sailed from the Isle of Wight in command of the National Antarctic Expedition. The expedition ship Discovery had been built especially for polar travel. Most of the crew on board were Navy men like Scott, with no mountaineering or other suitable training for the ordeal that lay ahead. Their selection reflected the bruised state of the British Empire. Queen Victoria died in 1901 after a very long successful reign, and the British were finding themselves embroiled in a very difficult war in South Africa against the Boers. And there was this sense that somehow the British were losing their place in the world, that there was a softness creeping in. To Clements Markham, Scott and his men represented the epitome of British manhood. Navy men who would battle the Antarctic and prove that the Empire could still win the day. January 3rd, 1902. Five months after leaving England, Lieutenant Robert Scott and his ship Discovery crossed the Antarctic Circle. Perhaps it was here, dwarfed by these massive icebergs, that Scott began to envision a greater glory for England and for himself, to be the first to plant a flag at the South Pole. Something of note here is that this is not long after Samuel Robotham and others have come up with zetetic astronomy and cosmology and other strong evidences against the global model and against the heliocentric model. So, some others have pointed this out in other areas where it seems like any time there's a strong opposition to the heliocentric model, that there is a strong reaction by the powers that be back against it, as we've noted as of late when, when it was first pointed out about Flat Earth, a lot of the stuff that NASA came out with their new photographs of the moon and new photographs of things in space like the Earth rotating. Silly photographs, but... Nonetheless, they try to combat it. So it's interesting to note that this isn't long after. This is 1902, 1909. So this isn't long after Robotham has proved that the Earth is flat. And so now what they're doing is going to plant their flag on the what they'll call the South, the Southern Pole, the Antarctic, the South Antarctic Pole and they'll plant their flag there and put out to the media that they have circumnavigated and mapped the area and that they know for certain this isn't true but this is what they this is how they counter the major argument they just go put it on their controlled media that they've planted the flag and that they know for sure that Antarctica is just a continent the southern pole had long played a secondary role to the north Sealers and whalers visited Antarctica's outer islands to conduct their bloody hunts, while ice and fierce storms protected its inner shores. Man had yet visited only a few coastal areas of the mainland when Scott's discovery docked on the edge of the Great Ice Barrier, a vast shelf of ice the size of Texas that permanently covers part of the Ross Sea. The sun shines with extraordinary hard white glitter. There is nothing soft in the landscape at all. It dazzles you, it takes you out of yourself. 
it produces the wish to measure yourself against all that emptiness, all that delectable snow. It seduces you and it is completely indifferent. The men explored glaciers where ice crackled like gunfire and snow concealed gaping crevices. Their wonder turned to horror when one crewman slipped on a steep slope and fell to his death into the ocean below. In late April, the sun sank below the horizon for its winter hibernation. For three months, the men huddled in their quarters as storms raged outside. When night gave way to the midnight sun, Scott prepared to set out on an exploratory sledge journey inland. He selected two men to accompany him. The first was Edward Wilson, an amiable doctor and artist, whom the men... Okay, so again, what we see is that as they begin the actual exploratory journey that he cuts off 90% of the 99% of the crew from seeing what he's going to see and figure out what he's going to figure out and this is the enlightened officer that has the astrolabe and the the stellar you know the knowledge about the skies to figure out what latitudes are at what things are happening and what's really going on here but he cuts off 99% of the crew from coming with him and seeing his calculations and this is the real this is the real exploration this is the part that matters the part that counts all the rest of it is just like a whaling ship they've just arrived at a location and these guys are just sailors they're doing their jobs they, so but we see again that as he begins the major polar exploration portion that he cuts off the crew from seeing what's going on to set out on an exploratory sledge journey inland. He selected two men to accompany him. The first was Edward Wilson, an amiable doctor and artist, whom the men had dubbed Uncle Bill. What was he really doing there? What he's really doing, you can see it clearly, is he's drawing out the sun and the sun dogs. Yeah. You can see, yeah. see what he's playing with there? Uncle Bill. What Uncle Bill is playing with? The second was Ernest Shackleton, an engaging Anglo-Irishman with polar ambitions of his own. On November 2nd, 1902, the three men saluted king and country with a champagne toast before the sledges pulled away. Scott's goal was to reach a record farthest south, possibly the South Pole itself. At first, the sledges virtually flew forward, but it wasn't long before the dogs became ill. The men used whips to spur them on. Still, their pace slackened. And what I've been showing you guys by showing you the old film reel is that imagine you're aristocracy and you know that the earth is flat and you've been running a deception on humanity and so you take film, you do things for TV, and when you do them for for public consumption and for major consumption, because you've developed film, because you, your film industry is developing, as things get better, as the technology gets better, and as you figure out more things about the way the flat earth works, you record those things, and you use them to teach your own family, the, the people that are in, supposedly the enlightened, and you you run these film reels for them, that show what the sun is really doing, how it really functions. So those ones that I showed you guys with the light sources earlier, with the convex and concave lenses, you can see what they were really doing is filming the way that it worked. They're, they've got the bowl, they've got the light source in the center of it. They, you know, they were filming for posterity for themselves. So I'd imagine that there, it's a possibility that there's two sets of every movie or a lot of the movies that we've seen over the years that there's two versions of not the movies but but documentaries like these that there's two versions of them one for public consumption and one for their own internal consumption and really they talk about look this is how things are really operating and they show they pass that information to themselves but out to the public we get these silly documentaries that we always see 
that I remember when I grew up, I would always have, as I watched these documentaries, in the middle of them, like the one about if Earth is flat in search of the edge. I remember seeing that when I was a little kid. And I remember that movie very clearly now that I had seen it after Flat Earth. I totally remember thinking at the time, my God, it's flat because the water's flat. How do you... He just proved it. But they still found a way in school to get us to get our minds away from that and forget about it. So, just thinking out loud, it's really interesting that I think that if you look at old film reels and old educational stuff, you're going to see a lot of things that are telling you by reading between the lines that the images they're showing you, they're going to be showing you the actual workings of the earth while they're telling you that it works another way. So, just thinking. Antarctica, the coldest, most savage place on Earth. So remote, its very existence was questioned by navigators for centuries. Even after it was discovered in 1820, it remained for decades terra incognita, a land unknown. But by the beginning of the 20th century, the age of Antarctic exploration had taken hold and the continent was being visited by a growing number of expeditions. Much research was being done, and there was a growing competition to be the first to reach the heart of the interior. One of the main competitors was Robert Falcon Scott. This was his hut, a place quite literally frozen in time. Scott had set out from England to make history, trying to become the first person to stand on the South Pole. He reached his goal, but when he arrived, he found that a Norwegian team had beaten him to it. Disaster struck on the return journey, and his entire party perished in the brutal cold. Scott's final haunting diary entry shook the outside world. Had we lived, I should have had a tale of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies... Again, don't talented. try to go there or you'll die. For years after his death, Scott was regarded as a hero, a British icon who had shown courage and nobility in the face of insurmountable odds. But as time went by, critics began to question his aptitude, calling him an ill-prepared adventurer whose bad judgment had cost his team their lives. He was portrayed as irrational, consistently inept. But again, he's the greatest hero, the most capable man, the most competent person, and he's also a bumbling idiot. A heroic bungler. I signed on to some extent to the legend of Scott the Bumbler when I first went to the Antarctic. But that legend just doesn't stand up against reality. Not when you get to know these guys, not when you look at the facts of what happened to them. Doesn't she remind you guys of the, the NASA lady and a lot of these spokespersons? They're hilarious. They're all the same. They have this thing about them. You can just tell that they're making crap up and lying. Not when you get to know these guys, not when you look at the facts of what happened to them. Climatologist Susan Solomon has spent years oh, in Antarctica go, studying the ozone layer. She became interested in Scott's story after a so visit no, to his hut, questioning the popular theory of his incompetence. She's going to tell us that Ant Antarctica is getting hotter and that it's all our fault for burning too much gasoline. Her conclusions were startling. What a joke. For rather than confirming his mistakes, I'm going to do a piece shortly about evidence of Scott as a how it's such a fraud. With a deep faith in science. Ironically, it was this very faith that would lead his team to disaster. They planned so scientifically. They tried to figure out how they would put what resources they had and what nature would normally be expected to throw at them together and be able to succeed. And they would have succeeded 